integrate backwards, you, everything comes to a point and the density becomes so large that the physics we have now doesn't work. So it's essentially a singularity. And for all practical purposes, time started in the Big Bang. So we don't have a very good idea of what could have happened before. There are multiple ideas of uh, Big Bang itself. And we know from using my, uh, microwave uh, measurements and so on that it happened about 13.6 billion years ago and so on. So if you are a believer in God, you can say that God <coughs> made it world at that time, or 6,000 years, whatever. And if you're a scientist, you say, well, what was God doing before Big Bang? And as Stephen Hawking points out, St. Augustine would have said that God was busy creating hell for people who ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so Big Bang happened, so you started with muons and leptons, electrons, neutrons, protons. You have the Higgs field, <coughs> which creates the asymmetry. And very quickly, you, they merged, and you got the early uh, elements like hydrogen and then helium, uh, lithium, and on the carbon. So all the essential elements of uh, life, like carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, they all came to uh, place very quickly after the Big Bang. So the rules that got set since then are essentially gravity and the uh, second law of thermodynamics, which, you know, they work, but they don't give you any moral guidance as to how to deal with human problems like uh, global warming. And second law of thermodynamics works for life also, but gravity can locally create order. So second law of gravity, for those who don't, don't know it, is essentially always this order is increasing. Chaos is increasing. So if you have an energy gradient, the gradient tends to get smoothened and the energy is used to increase this order. Right? And gravity can locally create order, so it seems to break the second law of thermodynamics uh, locally. And even life is argued to break the second law of thermodynamics because we consume energy and we create order. I'm standing here and talking after eating the breakfast that was energy in a, a more disorderly manner, right? So how do we then uh, go from there to life? So let's just zoom all the way down to the solar system, which got formed about whatever, 4.1 billion years ago or so. And we know that the Goldilocks syndrome essentially got solved in the sense that the climate of the Earth cannot really be uh, explained fully by just looking at um, the distance from the Sun. Because the Venus is really hot, Mars is really cold. So we created this perfect planet which is suitable for life. But that doesn't mean that life doesn't exist elsewhere or that life doesn't exist on Mars. We just don't know, right? From what we know, uh, Earth has life as we know it, and even the moon, which is gravitationally trapped to Earth, uh, got formed at some point early on, where some planetoid crashed into Earth, took a chunk out, got trapped, and uh, has stabilized the Earth's orbit. Otherwise, Earth would be uh, wobbling uh, much more, uh, much faster than it is now in terms of the precession and obliquity uh, cycles. So even that could have helped life. So what is life in that sense, right? We don't know exactly where life started, but we know that once we had carbon and water and uh, uh, hydrogen uh, in the early atmosphere, even during the primordial soup, we started forming certain uh, polymers of carbon, and they had lots of properties which are essentially life. They can store energy, obviously. This is why we have the global warming take out fossil fuels and we burn them, which is essentially carbon compounds. And they have memory, they have certain plasticity. And they could reproduce themselves. So uh, in the sense that Altman checked, left RNA in a, a, a petri dish for three weeks and it cleaved itself, right? So it's not life by itself, but it could reproduce itself. And water is essential, so we know that human body and all life is essentially mostly water. So, what is it that then went from the carbon polymers to life? So if you look at RNA and DNA, you have the basic nucleotides, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, and you place it with uracil in RNA. And in fact, to uh, form DNA, you need the catalysts that are in RNA to synthesize the proteins. So you know that RNA probably came before DNA. So you need essentially basic building blocks like hydrogen, cyanide, and uh, alkanine, and so on, which would have been abundantly available in the 
the primordial soup, they are not very special. But how did they exactly get organized this way? That's not very clear. Even now, if you take material from comets in space, deep space, uh, they do have the basic building blocks like amino acids. The only other thing that you need here is phosphate, which is not very easily explained, but betaurides called shriverside has a, a, a compound called shriverside, which is actually corroding easily in water. That could have released a lot of phosphate in the beginning. Okay? So, somehow, life got organized, went from RNA to DNA, and some small cells evolved, cyanobacteria, and the uh, best theory we have for how we went from prokaryotes to eukaryotes is by Liv Margulis, which said it's some kind of a symbiotic assimilation. And it makes sense because if you look at mitochondria and uh, chloroplasts, they have their own DNA, they have their, their own branches on uh, the tree of life. So it's all likelihood that they were independent and they got assimilated. Somebody thought, hey, it would be cool to have plastic so I can produce my own. Uh, energy and then burning myself by taking up mitochondrion. So soon you had multicellular life, more complex life, oxygen evolved, photosynthesis, and so on. So basically, you have Hadean, which is, comes from Hades in Greek, means hell, no life yet, as far as we know. Archaean, which is Archis at the beginning. Protozoic is early life, and then you have Phenerozoic, which is the visible life. So you have plenty of fossil evidence from uh, here on. So, looking at geologic evidence of reduced carbon, we know that life existed here. And you had age of invertebrates, fish, amphibians, and so on. So, in this sense, human beings are essentially, you know, appear on Earth in the last fraction of a second, but we have dominated the Earth now. Does that mean we are doomed to destroy the Earth, like a virus that gets you cancer, or are we able to actually save it? Right? So, that's kind of the big question if you want to actually go and try to model uh, cognitive behavior. So let's try to kind of put that in, in context of a bit more of the evolution, try to see if human beings are different than other species and how are they different. So if you think of the evolution, is it lazy? Does it spend as little energy as possible? Or is it spending energy when uh, it's necessary? So they looked at lice in birds and the lice that's in the feather that get pecked, gets pecked by the bird actually has learned to camouflage itself. Whereas the lice that's on the head that doesn't get pecked has wasted no energy in camouflaging itself. And the other way here, same, this is in the head and this is in the, in the feather. So you would think that evolution is actually lazy, right? But if you look at reproduction, almost the majority of the species now reproduce sexually, right? Basically because asexual reproduction, you just go fission from one uh, cell to multiple cells. And this takes a long time to evolve a good mutation and keep it. In fact, a small deleterious mutation and it can get wiped out. So this is energetically very cheap, but in terms of long-term survival, it may not be so uh, useful. Competitive, it may not be so competitive. Sexual reproduction, on the other hand, is very expensive. Just look at all the fancy dresses we buy, funny glasses we wear, right? We spend a lot of money in the uh, bars trying to woo the other sex and so on. So finding the, the, a partner and keeping the partner and getting the party to reproduce for you, that's a lot of energy. So evolution is not necessarily lazy when it is, but this is very uh, good in terms of competitiveness because you can keep quickly combine uh, uh, different sex, you know, two genders and produce good high fitness mutations much more quickly and you are evolutionarily much more competitive, right? So evolution does spend energy when it needs, but it tends to save energy when it doesn't have to spend it. So in that sense, it's not just the photosynthesis and the evolution of oxygen that created the planet as Earth evolved, mountains evolved, life has evolved, they have interacted with each other. But even the evolution of the human species itself from our ancestors has been shown to be mostly related to climate and climate change, right? So when we talk about stopping climate change, we are not really saying we want the climate to remain steady, but we don't want it to vary very wildly. We don't want it to go uncontrolled. 
right? Not all the eyes three syllables and so on. So the old world, the new world monkey split around 28 million years ago. Around 10 million years ago, you started going from early hominids and hominids to, you know, like Artificus and Neanderthals. Around 3 million years ago, they split into uh, the Australopithecus and Paranthropus and the Homo lineage evolved around that time. And the critical climate change here was essentially that East Africa, where we know by using genetic methods uh, that that's where the uh, Homo sapiens and Homo erectus, the earliest, the closest relative that evolved. There are other uh, uh, controversies there about how the Neanderthals evolved, why they lived in cold climates, how did they go extinct, and so on and so on. But essentially, around seven to five million years ago, East Africa used to be green, lush forests. So chimpanzees would walk you know, on all four legs. You don't have to go far to find food, and you don't have to run far from predators. But you went from what was a permanent El Nino-like transition in the Pacific. How many of you heard of what El Nino is? How many of you who, is there anybody who's never heard of El Nino? <laughs> you heard of El Nino? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's heard of El Nino? If you have El Nino, then you have dry climate in some parts of Africa. If you went from permanent El Nino to variable El Nino, uh, you can change the rainfall patterns. They went from lush forests to grasslands uh, and savanna. And this is supposed to have made it harder for uh, quadrupeds, things that walk on all four legs, to get too far. So they eventually evolved to be more energetically efficient and move faster by being bipeds like us, we move on two legs. But along the way, over uh, the last couple of million years, Things have changed, a lot of things have changed. We have evolved symbolic language, uh, we have built tools more and more efficiently. And there's something called Baldwinian evolution, where if you start using your brain and your hands to do more precise instruments, actually the brain evolves, gets more precise, and even got cleaved and formed left handed and right handed brain, so you became ambidextrous the thumb evolved, and so on. So not everything can be explained, but it seems like along the way the diet changed, a lot of things changed, and it doesn't explain how the addition or the change in the structure happened, why our brains are bigger. But there is some evidence that evolution does happen uh, in a way that things jump from one state to other by accidental mutations. So I'll show an example of that. Yeah, I should have mentioned that here. Actually, the, the earlier theories of big brain were basically assigned to the fact that uh, our ancestors went from eating raw meat and so on, which required strong jaws and strong muscles, to each, you know, once they got fired, they started eating cooked food and more fruits and vegetables and so on. Then the muscles relaxed and that allowed the cranium to grow. But it turns out that actually recently it was found that there are controller genes which control the side of the cranium and one of the controller genes was lost. And that's what made the cranium to suddenly grow bigger and the brain grew to occupy more space. But the brain is incredibly uh, metabolically expensive. When you're a baby, almost 60% of the food you eat goes into just maintaining the brain, keep the brain running. As you grow older, it takes about 25% if you're doing it work. If you're drinking and sleeping, then it's much less. Right, Marisha? So, such an accident also happened with something else. So this basically raises the question of what is it that gets replicated with time? Is it the chromosomes? Obviously not. I don't think there's anybody related here, so we don't necessarily share any chromosomes. So, Richard Dawkins has argued that it's the gene that gets carried with time is the gene that tries to survive. So we share a lot of genes, right? Marisha and I both have the gene for good looks. <laughs> Eileen and I both have the gene for intelligence. <laughs> Maybe she doesn't agree. So genes we share. So that's the basic unit that maybe gets replicated. But this has to replicate very precisely. If it doesn't, then you have accidents. And the example I can give you is a, a joke. I tell you. <laughs> uh, 
A young lady joins a convent to become a nun.